Rogers. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about what is industrial augmented reality. And to have us walk through this, I brought in the expert, the man himself, Bob Meads, who is the president at IQ Agent. So welcome, Bob. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited. I remember we met a couple of years ago, uh, pre-COVID. You came to our mm-hmm. lab there in Raleigh, and and I just remember like like kid in a candy store, like, is this stuff for real? You know, like this is really cool. <laughs> so you know, I, yeah, I, I'm excited for this conversation, and and. I kind of want, I was thinking about it. You know, we hear all these terms about, you know, AI, machine learning, IIoT. And if someone, we're at a dinner party, you and I, and somebody says, you know, what is that augmented reality from an industrial standpoint? Where, where are you going to go? What are you going to tell them? Well, it's, it's one of my, my favorite topics. And I like to boil it down and not use big words. And and the way that I usually explain it is augmented reality is just a way to place information directly in context of the real world. Mm -hmm. And so I may get a funny look at that, but then I ask him, how do you watch football? You know, I'm in the South, everybody here watches football. And I say, okay, you ever notice how the first down line just magically appears? You know, it's not painted on the field. The players can't, you know, can't really see it, but you can see it and it moves. That's basically augmented reality, or at least what it looks like. It's, you know, giving you intuitive information that you don't really have to think about because they put it directly in context of the real world. And that's what industrial augmented reality can do for you. So in the plant, um, let's say that you're looking at a machine and you've got a roller, you know, rolling out paper. And then there's this little floating thing that's showing you so many feet per minute intuitively you're going to say, oh, okay, well, that roller's going at, you know, 82 feet per minute or something. Right. And that's that's what augmented reality can do for you. And it, it doesn't have to be this, you know, magical, you know, game-like thing. It, it's really meant to be something that that is very helpful uh, and very intuitive so that people can work more efficiently and more safely. I love it. I love it. Because I, I typically... When we take, when I thought about it in the past, I, you know, I automatically go to the games like the Pokemon Go, right? But I hadn't even thought about that football line. I, mean, I guess that's been in place for years, you know. That's like, oh, it really has. And see, it's, I mean, it's not, you know, from a very technical standpoint, that's not technically augmented reality, but it's exactly what it looks right. like. When Microsoft Hololens, which is what they call mixed reality, mm-hmm. came out, the very first version. It was all about games and one, you know, and when they brought it out and they did the big thing on the stage and, um, you know, it was a game they showed and it was uh, like robot attack and your your walls and your house would open up and robots would pour out and you would shoot them with laser fingers. Right. When HoloLens 2 came out, there were no games shown. It was only industrial applications. Oh. And that is very, very telling because Microsoft understood that the sweet spot for augmented reality lies in manufacturing. They have money, they can really improve their life. And that's what they went with. Right. And I think that, that once you look at that and realize that, um, it shows you what kind of potential that augmented reality has for process and manufacturing. No doubt. And, and you know, you've been in the augmented reality game for a while now. I'm curious from your vantage point, some of the advancements, I'm sure technology is it's, it's, it's moving so quickly. What have been some of the coolest things that it has that has advanced over the last, you know, say three to five years? Well, you know, there 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 has been a lot, and we actually created IQ Agent in 2011. Okay, and back then, which is our flagship product, we were more assisted reality than augmented reality. And assisted reality just means okay, we're going to pop stuff up on your screen, and you can generally see the real world, yeah. but it, it may not be attached to a real world object. So it's really an information display or something like that, where augmented reality tends to have an anchor in the world. But we came up with the idea back in 2011. Um, but you know, you're holding a tablet or you're holding a phone. So one of the things back then was uh, one of your hands or both of your hands is encumbered if you're trying to see information displayed. That means you can't work. That means you have to put that device down. 
So um, one of the, the big things to come out, um, this is the new um, Realware uh, headset, the Navigator. Um, and it's actually, um, you know, this is the next one from their first one. It's much lighter, much more comfortable. But now, you know, because it's got this camera, you, you can see information, but your hands are free. Yeah. So one of the biggest innovations is we're starting to get these hands-free devices that are very comfortable to wear that you can wear all day. You can't wear a HoloLens 1 all day, but a HoloLens 2, you can wear a lot more comfortably, a lot longer. Same thing with a real wear. Yeah. I have to give them credits because they, you know, this, this new product is, 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 is really good, but then you've got Fusix, you know, you've got third eye, you've got some of these others. Um, also the, the processing power, you know, some of the advancements in technology, 5g is going to mean a lot because mm -hmm. you need a lot of bandwidth in order to do this. Uh, you know, and so the, the technology for graphics processing has increased the battery technology, which Elon Musk has helped move along, has also done this. And then the third advancement is really the buy in from some of your bigger players. So Apple, you know, they came out with their, you know, augmented reality library. And, you know, we feel that they're going to be coming out with glasses. They've all but come out and said it. And you can see down in the developer notes and in the beta releases, you know, these, uh, you know, mentions or suggestions of, you know, gesture interfaces and things like right. that. And then, um, so you've got, you know, you've got AR core, you've got, you know, what Google's doing, uh, you know, so you've got buy-in from Microsoft, from Google, from Android, from Apple, that they are going to be supporting this. Mm. And I think you're going to see the iPhone and the, you know, the, the mobile phones, are going to start to have competition once the wearables get into a form factor of something like this, but still be meaningful. Right. And this all started, you know, this all started with Google Glass. Yeah. It was called the Explorer and it had this tiny peripheral vision. And that was really one of the first things we looked at, but it was too small to do anything. You could put a single piece of information on there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, there's just a lot of things, but it was a start yeah. and it kind of got things started. So now we're at the HoloLens too, you know, we're at Oculus, we're at, you know, with, you know, the real wear and things like that. So those are really the three biggest areas, you know, that, that I've seen the most advancement and you're going to see more, yeah. you're going to continue to see wearables that are, um, you know, in, in increasingly, comfortable to wear, you know, less intrusive. And I'm hoping, you know, I think a lot of these manufacturers are looking at the plant floor and there's a lot of things that they have to do in order to be accepted on the plant floor. Right. So I think you're going to see a lot of that. Yeah. I mean, it almost feels like uh, science fiction is going to meet industrial here pretty soon, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, it really is. And it's, it's, it's being driven uh, you know, by science fiction. I am a huge fan of science fiction. And if you think of Minority Report where Tom Cruise is, you know, moving things in the air right. and, you know, a lot of that is is really kind of like an augmented reality or a mixed reality display. Um, and it does drive it. We see that. We want that. Somebody works on it. And I'm still waiting on my Jetson car <laughs> because I was promised that when I was a kid. That's right. That's right. Well, I am curious, you know, from a, from a culture standpoint with industrials, that can be a little bit harder road. Sometimes they're, they're, they are more of the, the late adopters than the early adopters. So how do we get these industrial facilities to start moving forward and changing their culture with augmented reality? Because I think that the value is there, but culture is tough in the, a lot of these industrial facilities. <clears throat> that You're absolutely right. That is the $64,000 question. Um but I have seen the acceptance level really come up. When I started in automation, uh, I got out of the Navy in 91. I started working for Siemens. I was working with their HMI software, WinCC, and Windows 95 just came out at that time. And they were working on Windows NT, Windows New Technology. So Siemens had an office uh, at Microsoft. It was called Siemens and Redmond Office. And... Windows 95 was just not stable enough, we felt, to go into the plant, but Wonderware felt it was just fine. And that's how Wonderware really took off. If you remember, they were on Windows 3.1 and things like that. 
<clears throat> so Siemens, you know, they were really looking at new technology and everything. And, and, you know, back then the adoption of new technology was seven to 10 years. Um, but when, when Windows NT came out as an industrialized version and things like that, then that came out and then automation uh, vendors in turn started writing software um, to be run in plants. And then that's where you saw your soft PLCs and things like that. But I've seen a progression where, okay, Windows doesn't go on a plant. And then it was, okay, well, Windows NT is going to go on a plant, but we're not doing any of these laptop computers because it's crazy to walk around with a computer. You got to sit at a desk with a computer. You'll be distracted. And then it was, okay, you can have laptops, but they're not going to be wireless because that's too much freedom. Right. Okay. And then it got to be, well, wireless. Okay. We'll do wireless, but X, Y, and Z. Yep. Now, you know, you've got these giant iPads, you've got these iPhones and you've got what were kids back then who grew up with this technology you know, the, the iPhone or the iPad 2 came out in 2011, which is why I started developing IQ Agent. So you've got these people that are now comfortable and they're white collars in, you know, the plants and they're thinking, OK, well, you know, let's get this technology in the plant. Floor. Right. And I realized that the adoption rate had really exceeded because 2011, the iPad 2 comes out. It's got a camera. It's got an accelerometer. It's got all the bits on it that you can actually make something that makes sense to be on a mobile tablet. Right. And my first customer for IQ agent, global pharmaceutical company, everyone would know exactly who they are. If I said, you know, said who they were, but, um, one of the guys, you know, their guys came to us and we did some programming and stuff. And they said, we just bought 50 iPads. And I said, what are you doing with them? He said, I'm asking you. So they, they looked at that and they knew that these things were going to be extremely useful on the plant floor. Yeah. So usually apps will drive hardware sales. In this case, they saw that, okay, and they came up with the term mobility. They had a mobility initiative. And so the adoption rate has gotten a lot faster. But the problems, the barriers, which is everybody's biggest topic, favorite topic. Yeah. Number one, do you have a good wireless network? Because if you don't have a good secure wireless network where you can reach the plant, then what are we talking about? You know, now we do have, you know, like IQ agent does have offline capabilities for forms and for documents and things like that. Um, but, you know, that that comes later. So, you know, they have to do that. The other thing is they, you know, need to adopt um, the use of electronic forms and the electronic documents. If they mm. don't have that information in that format and organized and you would be very surprised how many don't, then they're going to have some work to do. And they also, you know, a, a lot of plants for forever, you know, basically didn't want you using your phone uh, or an iPad out on the plant floor. Right. And here's a, a real life story. And I, this is a, a very um, passionate topic for me. So I tend to go, but I, we were also in a major automotive uh, vendor. And so I was showing this, this was 2013. And so I'm showing this and they've got the vice president of manufacturing down there. I'm doing a demo in their lab in this university. I'm nervous as heck, you know, and this guy, you know, he's asking all these questions, you know, for two hours, we're going around and he's scanning QR codes and he really likes it. So, you know, at the end, you know, I'm talking to him and I said, okay, so what do you think? And he says, Bob, this is, a fantastic application. This is so useful. I can think of a lot of things. We will never use this in the plant. And it, it got quiet. And I said, okay, why? And he said, well, you know, I don't know if you've been in an automotive plant. I had. He said, but there's this big sign when you go in that says there's no cameras or recording devices that are going to be allowed on this floor. Right. I said, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, everybody's got one of these in their back pocket. And this is a high definition 40 megapixel camera that can record. So either that rule, you're not enforcing it or you don't care about it. Right. And he said, you've got a point there. They changed their policy. They officially changed their policy. And the policy was, okay, you can't do this. You can't record everything in the world but you can use this technology to use these applications and here's areas where you can't, you know? And so that's where, you know, your device management comes up. But, you know, one of the big barriers is thinking just 
Okay, well, you can't have a camera here. Well, the, the benefits of a camera, the benefits of, you know, uh, that technology or mobile technology on Flight 4 outweigh, uh, in many, many cases, the risk, which, you know, security is a risk. People walking around looking at Facebook, getting run over by something, you know, zooming across the plant floor, that's a risk. you got to mitigate that, you know, but you can really make people very, very, very efficient and get their job done and like doing what they're doing. Um, you know, the other thing with wearables specifically is, you know, think about having something over your face mm -hmm. and, you know, something like a, a little warning pops up and it distracts you and then you get hurt, you, you, something happens. So, you know, that, that's one of the big, you know, things in AR that's been talked about, you know, for a long time is how do you make it so it's not distracting and device management can actually take care of that. You know, you know, with a good device management software like AirWatch or there are several others, you know, if you're wearing a headset and you're connected to it, if you walk into a secure area, you can have a room saying, okay, you're in this room, shut the camera off, can't use it. It's not, you know, it's not enough to tell the guy, okay, you can't record in here because that may or may not stop the person or you may forget. So, you know, the, the biggest barriers are <clears throat> having their data organized so that we can bring this data in. You know, uh, you know, data from PLCs, data from your SCADA, ERP, DCS systems, from your production databases, your documents, your schematics. Because what IQ Agent does is you take your phone and point it at a motor and I can get all the information you have about that motor. I can pull up the schematics. I can fill out a work order. I can see a video on how to restart it. You know, I can see the, you know, the, the points. Um, but in order to do that, it's got to come from somewhere. And if they're not organized you know, then it's a lot of work. So, you know, one of the biggest barriers that me and a lot of people in my field face is they look at the amount of engineering or the perceived amount of engineering that they're going to have to do in order to use the system. And they go, yeah, you know, we, we don't have time to organize all those documents that are on this gigantic, you know, shared drive. And, you know, it's not really organized and somebody, you know, we'd have to spend hours and hours and hours. And everybody has that problem. You know, unless they are very, very, you know, organized. Um, and that that's probably, surprisingly, probably the biggest one, uh, you know, that they have. And then, of course, another thing is just the perceived, you know, too new technology that, you know, some of the older people, you know, may have a, you know, un, you know uh, unconscious bias against, you know, about using these things. And uh, COVID has been probably the thing that has forced the adoption of wearables um, more than anything, because back in 2019, I mean, real wear was doing good. HoloLens, you know, some of these other wearables, yeah, but uh, some of the wearables actually did very well with COVID because now they had this need, they had a toothache and they had to do something. They couldn't have everybody in the plant. So they had a skeleton crew at the plant and they're thinking, well, the experts at home and, you know, and, and just waving your phone around and, hey, look at this and doing this wasn't cutting it. And so they need an application where he's wearing a camera, his hands are free and the guy's telling him what to do. You know, so remote mentorship, you know, kind of came about. Uh, and that really, I think, injected some. Uh, much needed motivation on the part of consumers, which then now they're willing to spend the money. And, you know, the, the vendors for these things started seeing, hey, you know, we need to get these out there, but we, you know, you really got to solve the problems. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know I'm going, but I'm on a point here. And, and the point is, I personally felt, okay, well, if I can get more hardware out there, that means I'm going to have all my software also. And that's not true because what I saw is a lot of people would just buy a wearable and they would put the free version of Microsoft Teams. That's it. Mm -hmm. They're not buying remote mentoring software. They're not buying XYZ because right now they're just trying to dig out of the COVID hole. Right. And so, you know, so now software is trying to kind of catch up and get on these systems that people have bought. Mm -hmm. So I know that was kind of a long answer. But did you get out of it? What I, I think so, for sure. I mean, a couple of things that really jumped out <clears throat> when when I think about the CMMS side of it, and there's still a lot of clipboards that are out there from a maintenance standpoint where 
you know, I'm going here, I'm going to look at this piece of equipment. I'm going to collect this data because this has been done for the last 20 years. This is how I got to do it. And augmented reality challenges that. And if I'm not, yes, if I'm not supportive of that with my management, with my culture at the plant, that would probably be a, a pretty stiff rub to get past it. I mean, that, that one jumps out, but then conversely, we hear about the skills gap challenge in industry all the time. And if I think about the skills gap and bringing new people into the plants to do these maintenance tasks, augmented reality could be a way to accelerate that skills gap and to get that training at their fingertips to, you know, right there in front of them while they're doing it in the moment. So you're not relying on the tribal knowledge necessarily, you know, that's still, there's still value in tribal knowledge, but if you can, can automate some of that and put it right there in front of the new employees, I see tremendous value. And that could be a, a culture shift as well. That is a fantastic point. And I'm glad you brought it up. There is this concept called just in time training. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge gap, you know, which is, which is a big thing that people are facing especially now because COVID really affected the job market and a lot of people that were at or near retirement right. just said to heck with yeah. it. Yep. And so, you know, but you, you know, the first point you brought up with the CMMS, you know, and, you know, utilizing that system, one of the barriers is that sometimes, you know, uh, software like IQ agent, over, you know, it, it, the perception is it overlaps with SCADA or overlaps with CMMS. Right. It overlaps. With. It's not really true if you really look into it. And so, you know, we look to integrate with those systems. But the skills gap, you know, a lot of augmented reality is a is a perfect fix for that. Because let's think about it. Here's a real world example. And I love telling this story. But, you know, if you think about context of information, excuse me, if you think about information in the context of the real world, that is a perfect platform to, you know, enable, um, you know, people to use resources to do jobs. And so here's the example is, you know, two years ago, my wife uh, or my daughter, rather, she has got a 2014 Toyota Corolla. You know, it happens to be silver and the headlight went out. And so, you know, like a good dad, I, I, I took it down, you know, to my, my garage and, or, you know, to, to the guy that does my truck. And, you know, I said, Hey, how much to replace a headlight? And then he set a figure that made my mouth go dry. It's like, no, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do it myself. So I go to AutoZone, the guy gets me the right headlight. And what do I do? I go home, I pull out my phone, I go to YouTube how to change a headlight in a 2014 Toyota Corolla. And I had four videos to choose from. I picked the guy that had the same color car as my daughter. I propped it up on the engine and I did what he did. And I was able to change the headlight and I didn't have any parts left. Over. So let's think about that. So I was operating at a higher capacity than I normally could because I had information right at the place that I needed, not in a classroom, not at my desk, but right there. Right. And I was able to use it. So if you think about, you know, uh, you know, when I was in manufacturing, I used to work for NEC Technologies and I was a production engineer and an electronics technician. And we had a lot of temporary workers, you know, they just hire temps and the temps would just kind of do the drudgery and they would, you know, we, you know, we made computer monitors and they're in the heat up line. We had the age in the CRT and they would go and check these and every once in a while they would get to something and they didn't know how to do. All right. right. So we're paying them you know, what eight, nine bucks an hour. They had to walk away and go find somebody. Okay. So there's a gap of time. We're still paying right. them. And then they get somebody. Now we're paying two people for this job, walk them back and then they get instructions or whatever. There may be some delay. So that problem may have cost us $35. <clears throat> but let's say that now with this technology, that there's a video floating right next to this thing saying, hey, okay, to reset this alarm, do this and this and this, or here's the instructions. It's no different than me changing the, the headlamp in the 2014 Toyota Corolla. The information is right there. It's exactly where you need it. It's not a four hour long maintenance course. It's a 30 second clip on exactly what we have to do right here. And that is a, is a huge benefit of augmented reality. 
And it's one of the stories that I tell where if you look at the knowledge gap, you get the older people that really know what the heck they're doing that that are maybe not so computer centric or, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're too busy saving the world. And you get them and say, hey, I'm going to shoot a video of you changing this filter. Put a good shirt on. Let's do it. You video them. And then you drag that in and associate it right there with that filter. You've just closed the knowledge gap by a little bit, by a little bit and by a little bit. And if companies could take this, they get a huge benefit because they're closing the knowledge gap, but they've got less experienced workers performing at a higher level with less errors. It's been, and that's the beauty of it, for sure. I'm, I'm curious from your standpoint, you've worked with a lot of industrial. Who owns it? Who, I mean, who inside these plants, who's taking the lead? Who's taking the initiative? <laughs> who, when, when it's not working, you know, who, Who's, who's getting called into to the office and then, but also who's, who's got to be that advocate. So I'm just curious from your standpoint there. That That's a great question. And that's also one of those $64,000 questions. Although with inflation, it's probably more like a $64 million that's right, that's question. Right. But, um, you know, you would think, and when we started out, I started going after senior production engineers, maintenance managers. You know, I can impress the daylight side of a, you know, a production engineer, but they don't have a budget. Right, right. And usually the maintenance person, depending on the company, doesn't have time and they're worried about their system. And they probably tend to see this as overlap with their system. Where I've had the most success and we're in some big companies, some, you know, global brand name companies. And the biggest success with them is at the corporate level, because you have corporate level technicians, corporate level managers, whose job it is to help these other plants bring in new technology. So they have titles like, you know, emer you know uh, external technology acquisition or lean, Six Sigma, you know, anyone that's involved in, you know, basically p making people more efficient, making the process more lean. And they like nothing more because they usually have their own evil laboratory where they got all kinds of stuff. And so I can get in with those people right. and get them working on the bench. And they're, you know, the, all the people from the plants are coming to them. Hey, we're having this problem. And so, you know, then they like nothing more to say, hey, man, check this out. Here's here's kind of a solution. And then you go get a pilot in that plant. Right. The thing is, if you're going to the plant in these big companies, a lot of times they can't make those decisions. It's got to be a corporate. Right. And so that's the number one thing is going after corporate. Now, you know, some of the companies we're in, the beauty of our solution is, you know, you don't have to be a big corporation to enjoy the benefits of right. this because our price point is so, so much more um, practical. Yeah. You know, that's why I call it practical up in reality. But you know, we're in like a small bakery up in Canada and they use it on their ovens. They use it on the roll racks. They use it in the maintenance areas just to pull up documents and a little bit of data and so for that, then you're looking at, you know, your lead engineer that might have a budget and, you know, basically he'll look at it, go to his boss or her boss and say, Hey, I need, you know, 4,000 bucks and I can outfit everything. I can, you know, here's how we save that money back yeah. uh, and you can do it. So, you know, it, it, it depends on who you're talking to, but, you know, obviously you're going to do better with uh, larger corporations, but it's a much longer sales cycle. Right, right. Well, it's a wonderful technology. And I tell you what, Bob, one thing our listeners can tell is, is you're passionate about it, man. <laughs> I love this. I, I've been living this and I am extremely passionate about it. And, you know, and I've told my son and I've told my daughter, yep. find something that you're happy with and you're passionate about right. because it's going to make your life a lot no better. Doubt. So I appreciate that comment. No doubt. Now, you know, we call it eco -S Why, Bob, and we, we always wrap up with the why. I'm curious for you. You know, and speak to that industrial listener out there. So why is augmented reality that technology that they really should embrace as they build for the future? Another great question. And it's because it comes full circle. Mm. And here's what I mean. Back in the day before transistors were invented, we didn't really have PLCs. And so you walk up to a piece of equipment and you have all the information around there. You can look at the valve and tell what position the valve's. And you've got a pressure gauge and you've got a you know power light and you've got in this hardwired system. When PLCs came about, we had this idea of process visualization. We put in controllers and then we moved 
the visualization up to the control room or out to an HMI panel. And what that did is it took that information away from the one place we really need it, which is standing right in front of the equipment. I can't go look at the motor, you know, and it may be across the safety gate. I may not even be able to tell if it's running, much less what the RPMs are. So what do we have to do? We got to go walk away and find an HMI panel. Um, so now, you know, as we get more and more technology, augmented reality brings us back full circle where we don't have to invest in, you know, a physical HMI panel. Right. If we just need that kind of information, we can just point our device at it, grab this information, see it on a point of interest display or see it in an augmented reality display and get the information I need. And not only that, but everybody can see that. Uh, even if they're not by that valve, you know, they can pull it up. So, you know, it's because it's kind of bringing it full circle. And the other thing that augmented reality does, which, you know, it's really the same situation as you look at how manufacturing is done, is augmented reality decentralizes your information. Because, you know, if you look at, a, a say, a motor, you know, SharePoint might have the schematics and maybe user manuals. They may have to walk back to the maintenance shop to go into the CMMS system to get the maintenance history. They may have to go to the vendor's website to get information, you know, about make, model, parts, things like that. Uh, they may have to go and look up a production report to see how it's been producing or, you know, X, Y, and Z. So, you know, they may have to plug in the PLC to see what's going on. That's five or six or seven different things. And you can't get a complete picture. Right. And it's because, you know, all your information is in all these different systems. And so with, with AR and especially with mobile apps, it's these technologies that have to come together to basically make this possible. Now we're pulling information from all those systems and giving it back to you where it matters most, right in front of the equipment. Right. Love it. Love it. Bob, this has been so much great information. For listeners out there, check out the show notes. You have ways to connect with Bob with IQ agent to see his solutions. Bob, thank you so much again. Anything else you got? No, sir. I really appreciate it. Uh, and you know, you guys listen out there. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Uh, give us a hit up if we can help you with it. Absolutely. Bob, you have a wonderful day, sir. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to eco S Y. This show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.